Welcome everyone to our virtual Vital Signs launch. We'll start with an introduction to Vital Signs by Ian Revel, our CEO, and then we'll have a short video followed by presentations on the areas covered by the report. After the presentations, we will divide you into breakout groups to gather your thoughts around the report and finish with a question and answer session. Can I ask you to stay on mute and also until you're going to your breakout sessions? And the best view is if you could put your screen into speaker mode. Staff are watching with the chat, so please ask questions as we go along. Over to you, Ian. Good morning and a very warm welcome to 2020 Vital Signs Report. Thank you so much for getting up early and joining us this morning. We're really sad that you can't be with us um, here in Margaret Power House. Um, because, of course, one of the wonderful things about the launch is that all the conversations that happen before and afterwards. But we're going to try our very best to give you an opportunity to talk to each other in the breakout rooms and in the question session at the end. So now we're all IT experts. Um, we've been practicing, so hopefully, fingers crossed, everything's going to go well this morning. It is very strange talking to a camera but I've got you live on a screen to my right so I can see you all busily talking and typing away and leaning forward as we talk, which is excellent. Uh, welcome, I can see Alexander Boswell, our president. You're very, very welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, Andrew Farkham, the High Sheriff of Buckingham. I see he's joined us. And to Councillor Andrew Geary, the Mayor of Milton Keynes, along with the other hundred and plus people that have joined us this morning. You're very, very welcome. Milton Keynes Community Foundation is a leading grant making charity with over 30 years experience of philanthropy and promoting philanthropy in the borough. We're immensely proud to be able to play our part in supporting our community in all its diversity. Last year, we supported the voluntary community and cultural sector to the tune of 2.3 million pounds. And this year, we've been extremely busy supporting our community's response to COVID-19. So far, since April, we've raised over £750,000 and £140,000 of that were individual donations from the citizens of Milton Keynes. We've made over £600,000 worth of grants so far to 140 different groups and projects. So thank you all so much for your support. You've made a real positive difference. Vital Signs is our annual report which we produce each year and have done so since 2013. We report on 12 themes and every three years um, we do a full report and in between we do a shorter report which focuses on the priorities for just the, Mil the borough of Milton Keynes. Vital Signs is launched across the world and across community foundations today. So there are a lot of people in similar meetings trying to find out what's happening in their communities. Our focus this year is on diversity, health and well-being, disadvantage and poverty, and crime and safety. These themes were chosen last year following several vital thinking events. And so that was before the pandemic started. And the research was already well underway. However, these themes really resonate still now while we're in this pandemic. So the report, which is very much looks at how our communities have responded during the pandemic. It also asks questions about what vital thinking we need to do to help our communities to recover. 
So since a Green Our Strategic Plan in 2018, we've also focused throughout the report on issues of diversity, equity and inclusion. Issues that are more sharply in focus because of the pandemic, but also because of some of the recent events in both at home and in the US. So you'll find throughout the report we've highlighted the diversity challenges in all areas of this year's reports and all those four themes. So like in previous years we're going to start today's presentation with voices from the sector and we're going to sprinkle in some of this year's findings. After that we're going to go into in-depth in depth, uh, presentations on all the themes. So, over to the video. COVID has affected Friends of the Caribbean in a number of ways. Because of the nature of what we do as a community organization, we were no longer able to have monthly meetings. We found that the older members of the community now had to rely on technology, which they weren't up to date with. We've looked at our database and identified the vulnerable within us, so we could communicate with them in a different way. The assistance from Milton Keynes Community Foundation has been tremendous. Without such intervention, we would not be able to stay afloat and we possibly wouldn't be an existing organisation today. We've seen referrals to the counselling service at YIS actually double compared to this time last year. Covid has really had a very negative impact on people's mental health and obviously in particular young people's mental health. Our service, um, the support that we give young people, never stopped. Um, it transitioned. It transitioned to telephone counselling. It transitioned to video counselling. I think, generally speaking, people's um, level of anxiety is higher. Um, people are worried about the future, people are worried about um, what this new normal is going to look like. And people um, are suffering from low mood and depression, um, you know, maybe not seeing their families as much. We're also seeing an increase in kind of um, suicidal behaviour and suicidal intentions. Milton Keynes Community Foundation have been a real um, support to us during this time and so we were able to use that money that they provided to us to provide these emotional wellbeing calls to our local community. Um, and we've delivered over 4,000 calls since the beginning of March, so it's been incredible um, and it's been a real lifeline to a lot of people. So Milton Keynes Food Bank noticed the effects of the COVID-19 crisis almost immediately. We issue uh, emergency food parcels for people who aren't able to, to feed themselves and their families and demand for those really did soar. Pre-COVID uh, we were averaging approximately 250 food parcels every week given out. Um, this sharply rose uh, during April to about a thousand a week and actually peaked at 1100. So this was so much more than we were ever used to uh, giving out. But with the funding 
From Milton Keynes Community Foundation, we were given the comfort that we were able to buy food and we could reach anyone in Milton Keynes who needed food during the crisis. Covid has affected MK Act in that we gradually saw an increase in people trying to access our service. We did um, see people who were more high risk, they were in more dangerous situations. The Community Foundation has really helped us during the pandemic. Within our crisis service what we found most difficult was people when they were having to move that because there was no shops open, they weren't able to access um, second-hand stuff because of the risk of infection and also the shops weren't open. So we had one woman who was a nurse and um, she fled her husband and she had nothing and she had to have a washing machine in order for her to wash her uniform to go to work so we were able to buy her a washing machine. The Vital Signs Report is uh, a way of promoting philanthropy in our borough because if you want to make a real big difference to things that will really change outcomes for people in our community, you need to have a look at the Up Vital Signs report and then you can direct any uh, donations you want to make to the Community Foundation to the places that are really going to make change happen. So the Vital Signs report is downloadable from our uh, website. If, once you've read it, please give us a call because if there's anything we can do to support you, your organisation, to make a difference in your community, we want to talk to you and somebody in the philanthropy team will be more than happy to give you help in filling in an application to access some of our funding. So firstly we'd like to thank all of those voices from the community that took part in that video. I'm going to talk about diversity. Milton Keynes has a diverse and growing population with nearly 20% of people over 16 years old belonging to an ethnic minority. As the video showed, the figures are higher for school-aged children, at nearer 37%. So over the next five to ten years, Milton Keynes will become a more diverse and culturally rich community. For this report, we have concentrated on three of the protected characteristics, race, gender and age and particularly how COVID-19 has impacted on these parts of our community. Some of the issues around diversity have been included in other sections of the report. This is to show the intersectionality of all of our vital science areas. The Black Lives Matter movement has highlighted many of the issues of social injustice, injustice experienced by the BAME community. We already know young black students are not achieving the same results as their white counterparts. At a Weaving Trust event held by Citizens MK, representatives of the Syrian community recently settled in Milton Keynes mentioned digital poverty as an issue for their young people during lockdown. Not all students have access to the same resources, stable internet, sole use of IT or a quiet space to work. It's also widely documented that members of the BAME community are more susceptible to COVID-19. And we report on the higher, of, higher mortality rates in both the short and the long report. The relationship between ethnicity and health is complex. Research has highlighted a combination of factors play a role in the increasing risk. Whether those from our ethnic minorities are more likely to have occupations that expose them to the virus. But other researchers suggest the case is just not that simple and much more investigation is needed. On average, Milton Keynes has a younger population compared to England. However, the population is growing and the median age has continued to rise slightly in the last year to 38. Still below the median age for England, which is 40. Prior to COVID-19 and lockdown, young people in Milton Keynes were already more economically disadvantaged than their older peers. 
In 2019, the unemployment rate for 16 to 24 year olds was 16.5%, compared to 3% for 25 to 64 year olds. The number of 16 to 24 year olds seeking job seekers allowance or universal credit because of, because of unemployment rose by 163% between March and May of this year. That's 700 people to 1,845. This is the highest increase in any age group in Milton Keynes. If we are to continue to grow as a city, it's important that we provide opportunities for all, but especially for our young people. The next 12 months is going to be particularly difficult for many. And now I hand over to Michaela. Good morning, health and wellbeing. This is a very broad category which includes both the physical and mental health of people and the factors that affect their wellbeing. In the 2019 Vital Science Report, we reported two big predictors of lifelong health were physical activity and loneliness. <clears throat> this year, we wanted to investigate how the imposed isolation and lockdown has affected our community. England was in complete lockdown for 82 days from the 23rd of March. This was before restrictions were later loosened so that we could form a support bubble with one other household. With many people separated from their support networks, this made issues such as depression and anxiety more heightened. A survey by MIND found that 79% of adult respondents rated being unable to see friends, families or partners they did not live with as a factor which made their mental health worse. Milton Keynes has a younger age portfolio than England as a whole, with 27% of the population in Milton Keynes being aged 19 and under. Milton Keynes Youth Information Service confirmed they've had the most referrals from counselling they've ever had in a three-month period, between April 2020 and June 2020, <clears throat> with 180 referrals for counselling. This is compared to 86 referrals for counselling over the same three-month period in 2019. Many of the reasons included depression, anxiety, loneliness, disappointment about leaving school early and not being able to see friends. Shockingly, national data shows there was a 44% increase in calls to suicide prevention helplines in the first three months of lockdown from members of the LGBTQ plus community, with many people being forced to live with family members who did not agree with their sexuality or were maybe not aware of their sexuality. Those aged 65 and over were most likely to be shielding, which meant longer isolation periods. In Milton Keynes, those aged 65 plus make up 13.8% of the Milton Keynes population. Age UK Milton Keynes saw their befriender service increase by 153% between March and June 2020, with many callers expressing feelings of loneliness. With much data still being gathered on the impact the pandemic has had on health and wellbeing, we expect to see many more reports coming over, over the next couple of months. I will now hand over to Jean. Thank you, Michaela. I'm now going to talk about disadvantage and poverty. This area is affected by many things. Access to education, employment, income, housing and health. In the long report, we explore these areas in more detail. The measure for relative poverty has been redefined recently and the threshold is now set at 55% rather than 60 as we reported in the 2019 report. A key principle of the new measure is that poverty should be related to the extent to which people have the resources to engage adequately in a life that's regarded as the norm in society. Previously, it was based on income versus expenditure. However, this did not consider that some families have access to other resources, such as savings. So our figures for child poverty have gone from one in three reported in 2019 to one in five for this year's report. But that doesn't mean that incomes have improved, it just means that the measure has changed. 
The new measure has been agreed by a leading charity on child poverty as a more accurate reflection. But even at one in five, this still represents nearly 11,000 children in Milton Keynes who live in poverty. In some areas, the figure is still one in three. From the research, eight areas of Milton Keynes are in the 10 most deprived in England, with two areas being in the bottom 2% most deprived. As well as high rates of unemployment for young people, employment prospects for women have decreased, particularly those with children, who are one and a half times more likely to have lost their job as a result of lockdown. However, the full effects of lockdown for the 34,000 people on furlough in Milton Keynes will not become evident until the government scheme ends later this month. In March, MK Food Bank were overwhelmed with the demand for food. Normal sources of food donations dried up as supermarkets emptied. Between March and July 2020, the food bank gave out more food parcels than the whole of 2019, averaging almost 2,500 a month. Support for rough sleeping has been one of the positives for Milton Keynes. The council put in place the COVID-19 rough sleeper protocol at the beginning of lockdown. By June 2020, they had supported 127 people who were either sleeping rough or at risk of rough sleeping by providing emergency accommodation. They commissioned 50 rooms at a centrally located hotel and working with other organisations, they were able to provide a full on-site wraparound service, giving people the opportunity to move into more permanent accommodation. However, the risk of homeless is still high in Milton Keynes, which sits within the 10% most deprived areas when being assessed on indicators such as housing affordability, overcrowding and homelessness. The average wage in Milton Keynes is £545 per week. However, the lowest 10% are paid an average of £165 per week and many earn something between the two. A two bedroom house costs around £900 a month to rent. So there were a lot of people who are only just managing in our 2019 report. As unemployment increases, so the risk of poverty rises. I hand back to Michaela. I'm now going to talk about crime and safety. For home, for some people, that is not a safe place. And lockdown put additional strains on relationships. The data we report on regarding domestic abuse and sexual violence is only part of the story as many victims feel afraid or are reluctant to report the crimes. Out of an estimated 2.4 million people who know today have experienced domestic abuse in a November 2019 crime survey for England and Wales, only 31% of cases were reported to the police. Women's Aid defined domestic abuse as an incident or pattern of incidents of controlling coercive, threatening, degrading and violent behaviour. This includes sexual violence. Thames Valley Police report that violent crime is still the highest issue they, in their reported crimes tables, with an increase of 18% reported in July 2020 compared to July 2019. According to the Office of National Statistics, 75% of victims in domestic abuse related prosecutions were female. 16% of the victims were male and in 10% of the cases the victims did not wish to state their gender. However, it is worth remembering that these ONS statistics are based on crimes which have been reported and prosecuted. There are many others which will have not reached this level. Whilst the pandemic did not cause domestic abuse, it created an environment for the abuse to escalate, with many victims looking for other mediums for support. MK Act saw an increase of 68% in, of people logging onto their website for support during the lockdown period. They state that due to victims being trapped at home with their perpetrators, they had reduced access to speaking on the telephone or seeking support in person. 
Hells Me Vile, Milton Keynes Sexual Assault and Abuse Support Service also installed a chat function on their website to be able to support their victims. During April 2020 to June 2020, they also saw an increase in new referrals to 53. This is compared to 35 as previously stated in 2019 over the same period. Homelessness is also an issue for victims of domestic abuse. With data reporting that from the last quarter of 2019, 12% of those who approached MK Council for support cited domestic abuse as the reason they became homeless or were at risk of becoming homeless. As noted earlier, domestic abuse is likely to be a hidden crime and it often takes victims a long time to accept the abuse which is happening to them and to seek support. Given the time frame of this publication, we expect to see more detailed reporting on the subject area and particularly the impact the pandemic has had over the next couple of months. I will now hand back to June who will tell us what we're doing for the rest of the day. Thank you, Michaela. So, as all of those figures and facts can be found on our long report and short report, which will be available on the website after today. We're now going to go into a breakout um, rooms with, in groups of about 10. Each room has been allocated a facilitator and they will make themselves known. They will take notes of any key points and feedback up on them to inform us for our vital thinking events. Sadly, we will not have time to take feedback from every individual meeting because we will be here for another couple of hours. But please feel free to add comments to the chat or email us directly. The breakout rooms will last approximately 10 minutes and then we will come back for some questions from the chat. See you on the other side. Oh, welcome back. I hope we've not lost anybody in the, uh, the breakout rooms. We're going to try something now which is uh, making me extremely nervous, which is to try to pick up some of the questions that are in the chat box. So um, what we're going to do is I've got Emily who's been taking notes and looking at the chat box and um, she is going to email me the questions as, as they come in and we're going to ask uh, June and Michaela to see if they can uh, respond to them. We, we'll try our best. If we can't, remember that you'll be able to access the long report, which will be on the website in the next hour or so. Um, so we've taken loads of notes from the uh, breakout sessions. Um, so that'll all be collected together and we'll keep an eye on, the, um, on all the chat that's coming up. Of course, um, you can email us in. If you go onto the website, you'll see there's the info um, at mkcommunityfoundation.co.uk. Um, so you must communicate with us and let us know what's going on. And we'll make sure that the reports are available downstairs in our two buildings, but you could probably download it much more easier. Right, let's have a look at the questions, what we got. Ooh, that's a horrible question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, the first one then, how many areas are there in UK, no, how many areas are there in UK and MK that are in the, which, oh, let's do it again, which are the eight areas in the bottom 10% and which are the two in the bottom 2%? in Milton Keynes deprived areas. Do we know? Or is that well, in the well, long report? We, it, it's not in the long report. We haven't actually named them oh, okay. um, because uh, the, um, the measure is done, it's not done by simple wards. It's done by um, a different calculation that the government, what you can do is on the long report, you can access the website where we, we gathered the information and we got, but we have purposely not named them because what we don't want to do is to sort of demonise particular areas and things. Um, so that's one of the reasons we've made a strategic decision not to actually name them. Okay, okay. Uh, next question um, asks, um, is the detail of the change in the child poverty measure available in the report? 
Um, I think so, but again, the reference is in the long report. Okay, so the long report. Yeah, we, we've done we've done a more detailed explanation of the change uh, in the long report, but also again, there is access to the website um, where the, where the uh, definition is from. Next question. I guess this one's for me. It says, uh, "How has the uh, community foundation been able to cope financially?" Well, there's an interesting one. I was explaining in my breakout group. Yeah, it's been um, it's been a tough call in the last few months. We've had a lot of donations in, as I mentioned. So thank you very much for that. But one of the really great things for us is that we've been able to make payments very quickly to the community groups. So um, in the emergency pill, if you had your application on the Monday, you could have the money in your bank account by the Friday. That included all the due diligence, all the assessments, the panels, and uh, the payment. Um, I, I think it was last week, the recovery um, um, uh, uh, grant panel, they issued over £85,000 of the grants. So we very much are watching our cash because there's a lot of money coming in and a lot of uh, money coming out. And I think somebody mentioned um, uh, also about how we're coping with our tenants. Uh, we're still quite full, which is really good. And I think the wonderful thing is that people understand that when, when they're paying rent into the Community Foundation, they're supporting our community. So uh, thank you to all our tenants for a keep on paying because we need it to make sure that we can issue all the grants. So we're doing okay, but we're keeping an eye on it. Uh, but thank you for all of your donations. Um, and we are already planning for what we're going to do next year to make sure that we can continue to support the sector. Um, we have had a couple of really nice grants from the local authority of 50 and 150,000 for the recovery fund. So thank you, Milton Keynes Council. And uh, half of the money that we've had for the appeal has been rose, raised locally uh, in Milton Keynes and half of, has come from the National Emergencies Trust, which is really good. So we've done better than most. Uh, we've got a very generous community in Milton Keynes. Okay, next one. What is the most important thing people can do to support the community foundation in, or our community, sorry, in the next six months, other than donating funds, what do we think? Do you want me to? Go on, that? you have a go. Um, I think donating your time is really beneficial. There are lots of charities out there at the moment that are seeing an increase in their service need. So, if you have time to give. Um, we would welcome that and um, speak to us if you need direction or, or community action we can definitely put you in touch with groups that fit your criteria or your interests so please do just get in touch with us another question is there a comparison in the report to other cities in the uk of a similar size no no, there's not. <laughs> However, no. you will find community foundations across the UK will be releasing uh, vital signs reports this week or other, other versions of reports. So if you look at the other 46 community foundations across the UK, they will have versions of the, uh, the report, so we can have a look at that. That's the way to do it. We, we, have, we have a lot of our stats are in relation to the average within England. Yeah. So um, it sort of shows our positioning in terms of uh, um, averages. But no, we haven't, um, partly because actually the information in terms of COVID is still evolving. So I think next year's report is going to be the really, really telling one. Okay, I think that's all the questions we've got, Emily. Stick a thumb up. Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> okay, right, well, I think that's, um, that'll do for now. But uh, as I said, we are going to be throughout the year doing vital thinking events where we'll pick up the main themes from this year's report. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up this morning's event with a few thank yous, if that's okay. I want to thank you all for participating so vigorously in your groups and in your questions and keep them coming in. The report is available on our website. The short report is a PDF, but there's also the long report, which has all the details and stats uh, for the, so the source research. Um, and that's where you'll be able to also click on other links and go deeper if you need to. 
Um, the print versions are available in our receptions in CMK. And oh, I think we send out some to parish councils uh, as well as uh, local councils and in the library. So there will be some out there. I want to give special thanks to our Vital Signs team, led by June, including the whole uh, philanthropy team, Ranjit, Michaela, Emily and Kay, and also our comms team, Rebecca and Hayley. Well done, Hayley. Didn't lose anybody in the breakout rooms. <laughs> Well, we hope not. <laughs> Thank you also to our volunteer uh, research team, Rose Ashbourne, Nigel Hicks, Nikita Cole, Jenny Ferens and Vasco Fernandez. Absolutely brilliant and we couldn't have done the work without that volunteer team. As always, this is a start. So please engage in the Vital Thinking events throughout the year. We also, again, I want to thank you so much for all your contributions to our emergency fund and the recovery fund. It does make such a difference. But I want to end by thanking all the wonderful community heroes out there that have made such a positive difference to Milton Keynes. It's a wonderful place to live and it's wonderful because of our wonderful people in our communities giving their time and making donations to the foundation and to the charities they want to support. Thank you all so much. So you know you've had the vital signs report. It's time to get on with the vital action. Thank you very much.